this is an opportunity for people to get to know their body and to understand the difference between something that is painful and something that is just uncomfortable. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today, I'm excited to talk all about gua sha, what it is and how to do it. So you've probably heard of facial gua sha, which is used for beauty. But today, I wanted to bring back our guest, Dr. Eileen Lee, to talk about gua sha specifically for healing the body from a Chinese medicine perspective. So Dr. Eileen Lee was last on our podcast for episode 215. So definitely listen to that one if you haven't already. In that podcast, she talks about her story, her practice, and she teaches us about acupuncture. So Dr. Eileen Lee is a second-generation acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist and licensed physical therapist who is passionate about making acupuncture and Chinese medicine accessible so that people can teach their bodies how to heal themselves. I'm super excited for this episode. Definitely give it a listen and you're going to learn so much about gua sha. Hello, Eileen. Welcome back to the podcast. How are you? Hey, Eileen. I'm great. I'm so happy to be back here with you to talk this time about gua sha. So very excited. I loved having you on the first time that I was like, you have to come back because you have so much knowledge. And I felt like we just scratched the surface last time. So today I wanted to ask you about gua sha because that's something that I enjoy doing. I, I, you know, we all start with facial gua sha. I think that's very popular now, but I started using it on other parts of my body. And so, yeah, I just wanted you to like bring your perspective, the Eastern medicine perspective. Absolutely. And, and just I have a quick question for you. Um, growing up, did you did you actually like grow up with gua sha like in your culture? I think I was aware of it, but I actually didn't try it until I was older and, and learned about facial gua sha. Like I've seen it in like Chinese movies and, you know, I, I have like aunts and uncles who might have done it when someone was sick, but I, yeah, I wasn't that into it. Right. You, you've been exposed to it and you were like, what is that? <laughs> yeah, I just, I was like, okay, I know what that thing is. It makes you look bruised. That's it. <laughs> right, 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 right. It looks crazy. Okay, move on. Yeah. So, so what is gua sha? You know, when, when you, people like Google gua sha, people, a lot of think it's like some kind of really infamous like beauty technique, but it's actually a very traditional Chinese healing technique that's been used for the last 3000 years. And it involves scraping the skin Usually with a smooth um, edge tool, it could be, and the tool could be made of like steel or jade or horn. Um, this right here is a gua sha tool. I know people who are listening to a podcast can't see it, but I'm holding a stainless steel gua sha tool. And the idea behind gua sha is you're scraping the surface of the skin and you're creating, and with friction, you're, it's with friction and with heat comes out of the friction and you can also sometimes, so when you're creating the heat, you can also create little small micro capillary blood vessel breaks. And that sounds a lot more intimidating than what it really is. What it's really, what's really happening is when you're breaking those small little capillaries, little blood vessels, you're allowing opportunity for new fresh blood to come into the skin. So better oxygenation to tissues, to your circulation, and better blood, you know, circulation allows better nourishment for your nervous system and your muscles and the fascia surrounding it. It does sound intimidating when you talk about how it, like, scrape, I know the term scraping sounds scary, like it sounds painful, but it's actually not painful. And you use, like, an oil to, like, it. it's more like a massage. When people say, like, oh, it's not that painful, but I think it's because for me personally, I've been doing it for so long that my body has been desensitized and learns to adapt. And because I know it's doing such a great thing for my body, um, I don't mind the discomfort, you know, the, the little bit of pain that comes with it. And also when you're doing gua sha, there's different like levels of pressure that you can also apply with it. So with facial gua sha, you're obviously not going to go as hard as you might do with body gua sha, which is what we're talking about today, right? So like body gua sha, the pressure is probably a little more firm because the purpose is to generate that heat sensation, to generate that friction, to generate, well, to create the, the small broken blood vessel breaks 
um, but it's not actually creating a wound, right? So think of it like um, like when you have an apple and, and it has like little bruises on it, but the skin isn't broken. Right. So what are the benefits of gua sha? I, I think you mentioned like circulation and bringing blood flow, but like, I, it, you know, tell us more about that. Yeah. So it, when I talk about the benefits, I'll talk a lot about the common types of diagnosis or like conditions that are treated with gua sha. So number one, it helps improve the blood circulation. In turn, improving blood circulation, we have this saying in Chinese medicine where there is pain, usually blood is stuck, right? So in turn, it's going to help improve pain conditions. And I see great success with people with um, receiving gua sha, a lot of my patients tend to have things like fibromyalgia or just myalgia, which is just muscle pain. And I also see it being used for allergies, right? So what is like the grand idea of gua sha? It's not just to improve blood circulation, but it is causing inflammation. And I always tell my patients and my audience, like when we're doing gua sha, it's causing a purposeful inflammatory response. And people usually think, wow, inflammation is terrible. Like we need to get rid of it. But actually you need inflammation to heal. So it's for those who live with chronic pain, those people tend to have a lot of inflammation, but it's an inflammation that the cycle never stopped. They they reached a certain level and then they just kind of stay at this low grade of pain and plateau where the pain just seems to get worse. So gua sha comes in, creates a new type of inflammation to tell the other inflammation, you got to go. And so gua sha in turn, what it also, what other kind of benefit you can get from it is improvement in inflammatory conditions. And also I have a lot of athletes, a lot of, um, boxers, a lot of crossfitters, for them, they find the greatest relief with muscle tension. Yeah. That's what I started using gua sha for. Like after I work out, you like do it on the muscles. So they're not as sore. Is that, so explain, does that work? <laughs> yeah, actually that's a, a great way. A great segue. So like when you're doing gua sha, like on the skin, you're not just tar- targeting the top of the skin, right? Like we're but depending on how much pressure that you're applying, you're also going deeper into the dermis, right? So it's that layer. It's like the top is the epidermis and beneath that is the dermis, right? And then it's the fascia and the muscles. So depending on how much pressure, you're moving the blood, right? But you're also moving the lymphatic system. So that's the added benefit of gua sha. But gua sha, I think, is really it's not as like well understood. People always think, oh, when I'm doing gua sha, I'm decreasing swelling, aka improving lymphatic drainage. But actually the true foundation of gua sha has always returned to improving the blood circulation. Mm, Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you that because you were mentioning before this call, how when you Google gua sha, the first thing you see is like lymphatic drainage. And that's what I thought the main purpose was like you, your face gets less swollen and you, you know what I mean? So you're saying it does help with lymphatic drainage, but that's just an extra benefit? Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. With anything like when you're doing acupuncture or acupressure, cupping or gua sha, the thing is it's not one like your body doesn't isolate to one system. It's not like you when you're doing gua sha like, you know what? Hey body, I just want to focus on lymphatic drainage today. Don't worry about everything else. The body doesn't work like that, right? Everything works in tandem and works cohesively with each other. What you affect with one system is going to affect the other systems in turn. So that's why I say, you know, like it, everything is an added benefit. But when in Chinese medicine, the idea of gua sha originated and was to be thought to help move the blood and tea. And in the simplest of terms, and not to get into the nuances of Chinese medicine language, when I say like to help move blood and tea, it's really just meaning to help reboot the nervous system and also improve the circulatory system. So with gua sha, is it like when you do it on a part of the body, is it basically, are you treating the part that's in pain or when you do it on one part, does it help heal the rest of the body is what I'm asking. That is a really great question. So a lot of what I'm talking about today is things that I've learned from my mom, 
who is also an acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist, uh, TCM practitioner, traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. So, um, and some of my own personal experience. When people, when there's a site of pain, like we talked about, that when you do gua sha, you usually go to the site of pain, right? And the really cool thing, like, let's say you have neck pain, right? Like you have a kink in your neck. So I might choose a modality like gua sha and we scrape and scrape. And the cool thing, what happens is where you said you had neck pain, the marks will start mm. to come out. The sha, sha in Chinese, when, so gua means to scrape in Chinese, but sha in Chinese means sand. The Chinese were very like Pictionary, like they had a lot of great visuals for their characters. So the sand refers to the small broken mm. capillaries, the blood vessels. And usually where you say you have pain, the sha marks will start to come out. And it's like when you do gua sha, it, you don't really necessarily have to tell me where it hurts. You could just tell me you have neck pain. So when the marks start coming out, I'll start pointing out. I said, was it here? And was it here? And you're like, yeah, it was there. And that's the really cool thing about gua sha. It's, it's kind of like scratching a lotto ticket and seeing wow. the winning numbers. Yeah, I love that analogy of like scratching um, because I've experienced that too, where some areas just get more red and darker than others. So can you explain like what's happening in the body and why that happens? Yeah. So when you're scraping, right, the idea of body gua sha is to actually cause the microcapillary breaks, those the, the sha marks, right? And for those who are listening, picture it kind of like when you fall off your bike and you skin your knee, but not like the open wound. It's just like, it looks a little like a rash. Um, I always tell my patients, probably not the best analogy, but I say it kind of looks like road rash, right? Um, and to some people, they call it bruising. Um, but even when you get bruised, what is that? That's a mechanism for healing. It's in, it's inflammation and it's, it's causing healing, right? So there's different severities of the colors of the gua sha marks. Some people, if they're relatively healthy, they're going to have less intense sha marks. But for those who have a lot of chronic pain, don't move as much, poor circulation, the marks will appear a lot darker. So that tells me color and, color and the intensity of the color always tells me the severity of a condition. Mm. What is happening in the body that makes it darker? Is it like the blood has been stuck longer? Like what does it mean? Yeah. So usually the darker the color is, what it's telling me, and this is not just poor blood circulation. But when you have poor blood circulation, you have really deep oxygenated red blood cells. So that area of your body doesn't receive a lot of healthy oxygen and you need healthy oxygen to your tissues because oxygen is a carrier for hormones and nutrients so when you do things like cupping or gua sha, acupuncture, acupressure, what's happening there is that you're improving blood circulation and you're improving your ability to um, improve oxygen levels within the red blood cells of the body. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. And it's funny because I think most people wouldn't even be aware of whether their body, whether their cells are not oxygenated, Right. No, I mean, that's never the first thought, right? I'm just saying that it's like, this is <laughs> revealing like, oh, like, like gua sha can reveal where you're not having good circulation and things like that. Exactly. Right. And then we can get into the like nitty gritty of like the cells. We can talk about a really micro level, which is, it basically just means that your red blood cells don't have enough great oxygen intake. So your tissues are not being well nourished. Think of it like, um, like a plant, right? If you don't water your plant for a week and it says on the instructions to water it one time a week and you go maybe like three weeks without, you know, proper watering, what do you think happens to the plant? It withers. It has, maybe it's turning a little bit brown at the leaves. But then when you water the plant, it regenerates, right? Obviously what's already brown won't, won't be able to be fixed, but new stalks will appear, new leaves will appear because you're feeding and nourishing mm -hmm. the body. And it's kind of similar 
like that analogy is a little bit similar to gua sha. Obviously, this is a scraping motion. It's a lot more invasive to the body, but you're regenerating your body to be able to heal itself because your body is already its own pharmacy. It already has, it's already stocked with its own painkillers, the best hormones that you could ask for instead of something that's from the outside, like Tylenol or Advil, um, you know, those type of painkillers or some kind of other crazy um, therapeutic tool. Gua Sha is just a catalyst on teaching your body how to heal itself. Yeah. Which makes me wonder, like a typical body, like why, what, I guess, what are the reasons why it stops working and it stops bringing oxygen to all parts of your body? Is it people who don't work out? Is it like, what is it? You know, because... Yeah, exactly. What do you think we do all day? Like we're being a human right. being, you know, I have patients asking this like all the time. They're like, like, why does that, why did my marks look right. so intense? And like, what's wrong with me? I go, nothing's wrong with you. You're just a human being. Like you work out all day, it depends on the demands that you're asking from your body right? Like if you are, if you work in construction, you're lifting and loading and you're building and you're nailing, right? Like you're probably going to have more physical issues than say someone who, I'm not saying someone who works at nine to five doesn't have physical issues, but it's going to be a different type of physical manifestation, right? So when we're not moving, what are, what's, what's happening? Our body is slowing down. Muscles don't have to work as hard Your circulatory system, you know, the way blood flows doesn't have to work as hard. So it's causing the the, the stagnation. (laughs) That's why it's so important to move your body in different ways. Always knowing when it's recovery time and, and during recovery time, it's that restoration that we need. Okay, so let's talk about how to do gua sha. Like, let's get into that. How can people start if they're at home, whether they have a tool or not? Well, I, I always say go into your kitchen and open up your fridge because chances are you probably have a gua sha tool in there. You don't need anything fancy. There's certainly very great tools on the market um, that's already designed in, for its own purpose to actually do gua sha, but um, gua sha really started off as folk medicine. So, you know, in rural China, a lot of people didn't use gua sha just for pain. It actually originated to help reduce fevers too. So, um, in rural China, we didn't have things, antipyretics, like things to help reduce a fever like Tylenol, right? They would do gua sha. They'll find anything, a stone, um, like the edge of a soy sauce dish, something to help create that physical motion to help their loved one, you know, come down from heat. And before you go on, can you can you clarify why it helps with fevers? Like why does creating inflammation in your body help with that? That's great. That's a great question. So what's happening when you have a fever? I mean, it's basically when you have a rise in temperature in your body, right? It's your body, your body is trying to fight off something. So that's already inflammation, a systemic type of inflammation, whole body issue, right? So when you do gua sha, this kind of goes back to when I said, you know, we tr- we cause a different type of inflammation, a more purposeful inflammation to fight another inflammation, right? Inflammation isn't just like one type of process, There's so many different types of inflammatory responses that our body has, which I won't go into the crazy science behind it, but just look at it that way. So um, what's happening here is that because in Chinese medicine, when you're having a fever, you already have what we call an excess of heat. So you have heat that shouldn't be there. So when you do gua sha, you're causing the heat on the back of your body because that's where they typically do it for fevers. And it's venting out heat. It's releasing heat. So you're bringing heat that's internal in the body to mm-hmm. its surface. And that's why you'll see a drop in, in okay. temperature. Okay, got it. Okay. So you were saying... Yeah. <laughs> so yes, now we're, now yes. we're back in the kitchen. <laughs> so now that we're back in the kitchen, um, you can use... This is my favorite tool. And still my go-to today, I like to use a sauerkraut jarlid or pickle jarlid. 
It's so specific. And I don't have a preference with any <laughs> brand. <laughs> so Well, because we eat a lot of um, probiotics uh. in my house. So like kimchi and stuff, but not a plastic jarlet. It has to be metal. And the reason why is because it's the perfect shape and it's also a perfect shape, perfect material. And the edges are not as sharp. You don't want a sharp edge of a jarlet, the bevel area. Uh, it's very lightweight. And it's not as high of a learning curve. You can control the amount of pressure that you want to use with it. And it's also very sustainable. So for the process of gua sha, you also need a medium. So what I mean by that is something that kind of glides, like that that lubricates the skin, because it would be very painful to do gua sha on dry skin. And while you're in that kitchen, you're going to grab some cooking oil. Preferably, you know, extra virgin olive oil. It could be avocado oil. I would stay away from like truffle <laughs> oil, things that kind of so like fragrant. are very yeah. fragrant. But if you do a skincare routine, you can use your rosehip oil. You could use your buckseed oil. You could use, um, was it black seed? I think it's black seed oil. Almost any kind of type of oil, as long as it's not spicy, you know, keep it as simple and one ingredient as possible. You take a little bit of the oil and you apply it at the site of pain. So let's say, for instance, we are talking about neck and headache pain. That's one that I commonly treat and one you can also do for yourself at home. That's not too difficult. So I know for those who are listening, it's definitely hard to see. And I think you're... Yeah, just come to the video on YouTube. Some video footage. (laughs) Yeah. Well, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can watch it on YouTube. But basically, um, and I'll show it here. Here I have a little, it's an Mm -hmm. acupuncture man. So (laughs) I had put stickers on the back of his neck. And I like to start for headaches and for neck pain. This is great for anyone who just has like stiffness in general. You don't have to have headaches or like true neck pain, just things you want to help improve and invigorate the blood and, and move your body. You could start at GB20, gallbladder 20. So that's at the base of your neck. If you take your two hands and your two thumbs, you're going to place them on the back of your head and where your thumbs drop in. And if you push up, you'll fall into a little ditch. So that's your reference point. And then you're going to, from there, you're going to put a little bit of oil all around at your neck and at where GB20 is. You don't need to put it in your hair because the hair is a protective layer when you're doing gua sha because you'll go up with the gua sha tool. So where GB20 is, and now that you have applied the oil, you'll scrape up in a scraping motion. So from your shoulders up your the, that side of your neck. Yes, from, from where the shoulder and the neck meets, you'll scrape up like so. And I would always start off with relatively light pressure for the first time. The reason why is because this is an opportunity for people to get to know their body and to understand the difference between something that is painful and something that is just uncomfortable, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. So I always say to, say to my patients, I say, okay. It's like, obviously, like when I do it on them, it's a little different, right? Like I'm efficient and I know what I'm doing. But when I'm teaching it for the first time to somebody who's never experienced this before, I always tell them, scrape light. Like you you are gliding a piece of paper on top of your skin, right? And the reason why I have people do that is because I want them to feel the sensation of the lid, like the edge of the lid, because that's going to gear how much pressure you're going to apply. And then as you get comfortable, then I say, okay, now push down a little harder and scrape up. So what happens after about 10 to 20 scrapes? That's kind of the gauge I give them. About 10 to 20 scrapes. What people find is that the, it feels a little warmer, right? So then I say, okay, now touch, your, touch that part of your neck, right? And they're like, oh, it feels, if, and you can compare it to the other side of the neck that you didn't do yet. They're like, oh, it feels warmer. I'm a, and I would say, go, great, now do it for another 10 to 20 strokes. The same amount of pressure, you know, whether that's medium or light. Whether or not SHA marks appear is okay in my book. 
because as long as you feel the warmth being generated, heat helps improve circulation regardless. Now, I know sometimes people feel very turned off by the shop marks. And sometimes I have patients say to me like, you know, I'm going to a wedding next week. So I will I heal in time? They're like, I really want it, but will I heal in time? And I'm like, yeah, you're going to heal in time. Or no, you're not going to heal in time. Some people get very turned off by the shot marks or they feel that it's it looks very intense. But I will say that most people who have received real body gua sha don't care. <laughs> because when you feel relief and you feel better, it doesn't matter. So um, going back to the model, they're starting from the shoulder and at the neck junction and then scraping up to where the GB20 is. And then past GB20, you could even go past into the hairline and go up. So that's where I said you don't need to apply oil because the hair is a buffer. Now, if you are bald, apply a little bit of oil in that area. So, you know, you're not scraping on dry skin. So I would just work this whole line and then work the whole line on the other side. And it's safe to do gua sha about one to two times a week with about two to three days in between. Now, if you press really hard and marks already start to come out, then you don't really need to necessarily go a second time so soon. You know, then give your body like a week. So explain why you, you're you showing us going up. Because I've seen people talk about going down along your your neck and shoulder. So <laughs> which way? <laughs> Honestly, it's a personal preference for me because the goal of gua sha, some people do that because for me, it's comfort. It's comfort level. It always, that's what it always comes down to. Some people say, because you want to go with the lymphatic system and you want to improve the drainage. But remember the idea of gua sha wasn't to improve the lymphatic system, the swelling. The idea was to just move blood. So I tell people to go up, but then if they find it to be more comfortable to go down, they can go down and that's fine too. And I've done it both ways. What I will say is whatever is ergonomically comfortable for you, that is the most important part. And remember the outcome is to help invigorate the blood and help improve pain. So you're saying as long as you feel heat, that means it's working, like something is happening. Yeah. Some kind of warmth, right? And again, you want to compare it from side to side. So one side you didn't do, the other side you did, and it, you have to feel a rise in temperature. And if you get marks, it's totally okay. That's beautiful. That means blood is being moved. That means deoxygenated blood is healing and, and as well as tissue. So to me, it's such a nice bang for your buck. Um, I have a lot of patients who get massages and they find it to be that they have very short-term yeah. relief. What's also happening when you're doing gua sha is that when you have so much pain and restriction, you're also breaking up some of that scar tissue mm -hmm. there too, some of that fascial adhesions. And that's connective tissue that hasn't moved in a long time. So when you're doing it, you might feel a little crunchy. That's okay. Totally okay. Just don't do gua sha at the very front of your neck because there's a lot of very important artery structures there. I'm not saying I've never done it, but it's better to go see someone who is advanced in it. Okay, since you're on that topic, like where are the parts that you recommend us do gua sha and where, where not to do? Is it just the neck? I say everything on the back is totally a-okay. It's, 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 it's a no-brainer. When I say it's at the very front of your neck, you can do it. Just be cautionary. I think what happens is people are a little bit too aggressive. So we're better off saying mm. just don't do it. You know, you're better off doing self-massage or you can do gua sha, but you, like watch the tutorials that focus on that. Um, and I, I, I would have to reference to like those who talk about lymphatic drainage, right? But the idea is that you're not trying to create crazy sha marks on the front of your neck. Um, I mean, it, it will look like hickeys for one. <laughs> I have done gua sha here along like, like this way. And I notice it gets red really fast here. Yeah. So for you, potentially there could be a lot of restrictions. You know, um, I can imagine people who like work at a desk all day, 
right? And you're looking down and your neck is shortening, the blood's not moving, and you're staying one position. So when you do gua sha, marks will surface a lot faster than someone who, you know, meditate. I'm not saying you don't meditate, but like someone who moves their neck more, who gets massages, who's a monk and has a perfect diet, you know, like someone like that probably won't have marks like that as much. I see like marks in the front of the, um, right below the collarbone area and Chester, a lot on people who have um, difficulty mm. with breathing or asthma or something very emotional yeah. going on in their yeah. life. So gua sha is also a big release for a lot of people. Yeah. I, I want to bring that in because I think it it can, I mean, let me know your perspective on this, but do you believe it can help with sure. emotional release? Because like this is the heart chakra, right? Oh, absolutely. And the heart chakra is related to emotion. Yes. So if you're like healing anything yes. related to here, I feel like it helps you release something. Yeah. You know, like there's specific acupuncture points. We we talked about it in school and I've heard in classes where, um, you know, like it, this goes back to like things, nothing in your body is isolated from each other. There's no system that's isolated. Like um, people go to, people go see mental health, like going to talk therapy. And that's one way of like helping them physically release from their body. And for some people, like talk therapy doesn't work for them, right? And some people enjoy that physical release mm-hmm. more from like gua sha or acupuncture or, um, you know, acupressure, cupping. And in turn, their mood also changes. So it doesn't matter how you engineer it, reverse or forward. Whatever works for the individual is more important. So um, I'll share with a personal experience. I remember when I was going through like a terrible breakup. I harbor, I like harbored so much like emotional, like, you know, anger and frustration. And my mom came to visit me one time. I think this was like in college. She's like, you know what? Let's do Gosha. And because my mom's not a big talker, most Asians like (laughs) immigrants are not big talkers. She goes, you need (laughs) Gosha. And I'm like, okay. She did. I had the best sleep of my life. I actually slept for the first time. Where did she do it? Which by the way, that's another benefit. She just did it on my neck and on my back because we hold a lot of our own issues in our tissues. There's that really famous saying, yeah, we hold a lot of our own issues in our tissues. So anything that's like stressful, um, not being able to express yourself, harboring anger, you know, that that frustration, or even being depressed. Anything that helps move the blood, right? That's but anything that's negative is holding yep. and staying yep. and still and not moving. So while gua sha is to some people a very, you know, body gua sha is very invasive looking, it actually is a type of therapy for some people to help them release, especially like if their first language was never to do like talk therapy and they already have a hard time expressing yeah. themselves. Thanks for sharing that. I love how it, it all connects, how like, you know, because you hear about books like The Body Keeps the Score, how emotions are stored in our bodies. And it's true when you get stressed or when you're just any emotion, it, it, it can, you your body tenses up and it things get stuck in those muscles, right? So I love how it's like, your mom can't doesn't want to talk to you about it, but she'll like, let's do gua sha. Like that's right, so right. I love that. She's like, you're sad. Let's do gua sha. I love it. It, <laughs> it also opens our eyes that there's more than one way to do things, right? There's more than one way to release. Absolutely. You know, and like for her at the time, it was a way of like her communicating with me. You know, I, I look back at it now. Yeah. That's her way of caring for you. Yeah, that's you know, or a plate of fruit. That's like <laughs> That's their way of caring. So, you know, they're in, in especially in like Chinese culture, they're not as like expressive, you know, especially immigrant parents. So plate of fruit, gua sha, like that was my thing. I love that. <laughs> That's cute. Um, okay. So let's talk about what other, I guess from your experience, what are the main things that you treat with gua sha that gua sha is like so um, effective for? Obviously, number one would be pain, right? Chronic pain. Um, I probably don't do it for acute pain, like not for fractures, not at the site. So that's like a no-no. But I would go above and below things that you know might be good for. I've used it for TMJ, so that's jaw pain, jaw jaw pain disorders. I used mm. it for sleep. That's a big one. People don't think about that, but um, it. But typically, it's not because 
they're like, when I, when I have a patient, their main complaint was like, oh my gosh, I have insomnia. I'm like, you know what? Like it's, it's usually because like they, they're so focused on their pain. They don't think about their sleep, but if you're in pain and you can't sleep, that's a problem, right? Why gua sha is so awesome because it helps rejuvenate you. It's almost like kind of like a detox, but you do need to rest after. So a lot of the big benefits are like sleep, and for those who were in pain and, you know, got insomnia, it actually helped fix their mm-hmm. sleeping patterns as well. So I guess I can add to the list insomnia, right? Sleeping, sleep issues. Um, it can also help with allergies. So those who have like seasonal allergies or if they have and within that, like people who have like asthma because they already have a hard time breathing and they have... Um, like, obviously I can't change their, like their, um, triggers, right. If it's like dust or something or whatever, but you can at least teach them how to like open up their chest. And when they see me, it's like, I can help nourish their lungs from doing gua sha. When you're doing gua sha, just, just to add like at a physiological standpoint, especially on the back, there are nerves that shoot out from the spinal cord and the spinal cord is encased by our spine, the vertebrae, right? The spinal, the spinal column. So those nerves connect to our internal Mm -hmm. organs in general. So for a lot of people like those who, um, you know, are, are big drinkers or, you know, they eat a lot of processed foods, it can help improve their digestive system. And it can help improve their liver function on as the well. back near the spine. Yeah, yeah because if I'll yeah. send you a picture later, but basically nerves come out of this one big right. spinal cord and they they connect to our internal organs. So now you're not only treating muscle tension, you're getting you're getting so much benefit from treating all your organs because it's so mm, restorative. That makes so much sense. That's why it's most commonly used on the back because you're kind of hitting so many things at once. Exactly. Exactly. And of course you can use this on your IT band. You can use it on your leg. You can use it on your calf, especially those oh, um, foot pain, plantar fasciitis, right? People commonly think it's an inflammation. That's what, that's how it's named. Fasci- anything that's itis is inflammation, but actually mo- majority of foot pain when they're diagnosed as plantar fasciitis, it actually means there's a lack of blood flow to that area of the inside arch of the foot. So I've used it for, I use gua sha in that area of the foot, but also above because there's certain arteries that lead and nourish that area to the arch of the foot. So I'm helping improve the blood flow to, to the arch of the foot. So people don't have pain in their, in their, um, that's actually my latest favorite area to treat with gua sha is to do my gua sha my feet and kind of my lower leg before I sleep because like the foot is also in reflexology it's like connected to everything right in your body yeah 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 you see those charts and you're like I'm just gonna hit it all (laughs) I'm like this is easy let me just do it here um but you know, when you travel, I I went to Asia, you know, you're walking every day, like 20 steps, 20,000 steps a day or something. So I I noticed that when I gua sha my feet after like a whole day of walking, it doesn't hurt the next day. Normally your feet get sore after work, you know, if you go to Disneyland or something like that. Exactly. What, what made you um, start doing that? Was there something that you watched or? I did watch like a foot (laughs) and leg gua sha tutorial, but I actually, I have like on my left foot, like a bunion sort of thing. So it's like, there's a point of pain that, and I've seen like a orthopedic doctor about it where like the bone is growing a different way. So at some point, like it did hurt like one point of my foot. And so I started doing gua sha to see if it would help. And now the pain has like gone away from gua sha. So that's amazing. Yeah. Like I, yeah. something's working, like something's healing there. So I, I, and I noticed when I stopped Absolutely. doing gua sha, the pain would come back. So I would, you know, whenever the pain comes back, I just right. do gua sha to like treat it. <laughs> hey, yeah. You're so smart. You already know, right? Like, cause you know, things like bunions and stuff like that's, it's, um, for those who are listening, like that's a structural change, right? That it's not necessarily going to, it's very hard to reverse it. Like most of the time, depending on the severity, if it's really impacting your life, um, surgery is usually the the last option, right? But 
I, I don't, you know what? I don't think we talk enough about exactly. foot health. Like, oh my God, this is we, a whole topic I could get into because I got so into foot health after this issue. Next podcast. Well, what happened was I went to this orthopedic doctor and he said, well, he's like, there, yeah. there's absolute, there's nothing you can do. The only thing you can do is surgery. You, when you're ready to get surgery, come to me. And I was like, I don't, I'm not ready for surgery. So like I went home and I did my own yeah. research and that's how I found gua sha. I bought all these like, like toe separators. I bought these things because I think ultimately it was like the shoes that you're wearing causes your bones to grow a different way. That's a whole topic, right? Humans feet are supposed to have wide toes, like wider toes. Anyway, yep. so I learned about yep. foot health and I learned about gua sha and I was just, I was flabbergasted that there were so many things I could do to heal my foot that that doctor didn't tell me. He literally just told me the only thing you can do is surgery. Well, you know, you have to remember surgeons are very, but like, I wouldn't say all of them. There's some really great surgeons out there um, who like to be more conservative, but some are like, I just want to operate. And like, they, they kind of like live in their bubble. Um, I'm definitely... Yeah. yeah. Like they didn't even give us any other options where I, when I looked online, I was like, there are so many other options, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. Like, why don't I try all the conservative right. things first before right, right. surgery? Right. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you had like such Thank great you. success with Gua Sha and like, that's a really nice personal yeah. story to hear about. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, and like, just to not to go off on a complete tangent, but like, we really don't talk about foot health, you know, and like Gua Sha, it's not, I'm obviously I'm not talking about the demonstration here today. I'll definitely make a TikTok or a reel about it soon, but it's, I think almost everyone should, should get to know their feet. It's so important. I mean, why don't you go into it? Like, I want to hear what you you have to say about it. Like, what do we need to know about our feet and foot health? You know, I, I feel like we, we, we bundle up our feet so much. And, and here's the thing, like, I'm not probably going to be one of those people that wears like barefoot shoes, really. Just like, I, I can't get behind the idea of like the toes, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, the yeah. Vibram shoes <laughs> and no tea, no shade. Like, I love them. I just can't like not for think of myself yeah. <laughs> when I'm going to wear that. So for, so for me, I'm like, okay, but it, but I've, I've seen barefoot shoes where like, they don't have that look, but they're still, they still function like barefoot shoes. But like in my household, Everybody wears slippers. Like that's just like the thing, right? It's like don't walk around barefoot. Um, I said, and, and my mom always say, like, you're a young lady, don't walk around barefoot because it's not good for women. And this is Chinese culture and Chinese medicine, right? Because it it, it can create low back oh. pain. And I was like, mom, that's crazy. And I go out of school. I was like, oh, that makes complete sense. The first kidney point, which is kidney one, is at the bottom of the foot. And then the channel travels all the way to the low back. Of course, that's why a lot of young girls, especially when they're going through puberty, they're running around barefoot on cold floors. And especially during the time of the month, their back starts to hurt more. So my mom is the original influencer. She, before me, she, she would do foot soaks mm. every single night. Like, and she still does every single night. Gives, really treats her feet well buys the best shoes. She doesn't put a price on it, you know, and she actually owns the Vibram <laughs> shoes. <laughs> and she, she walks so you're around saying in it's them. it's not good to but, walk um, around bare feet or it, it, it is, No, right? it's, it's good to walk around. I just can't get behind <laughs> the aesthetic of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's good to walk around in them. I just, I just can't do it, but, um, because yeah. it doesn't match my outfit. Yeah. That's the problem. You know, and I also, I used to be a physical therapist, so I never, I always like try to find the best shoes to wear or if I can get, or if I go to a beach, I love walking barefoot in the beach because you're working all the little tiny like flexor muscles, the intrinsic foot muscles to help strengthen. Cause think about it. When's the last time, well, you live in California, but like when's the last time you walk on a beach and you should be doing that kind of like every day, right? It. Every, like when you have hip pain, jaw pain, shoulder pain, it all starts mm. from the feet up. Wow. Yeah. Not necessarily always from the jaw down. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Or from the so head down. So you're just saying for better foot health is like walk around barefoot more if you can. Yeah. yeah. Getting to your feet. Yes. Massaging your feet. Yes. Wash out your feet. Everyone should try right? it. 
Every, everyone should try. You, you don't, it's so cost effective and you don't have much to lose. Exactly. And it's really relaxing. It actually does help me sleep better. Like it's, I think gua sha in general, it just relaxes your muscles. So that's why you can sleep better. Exactly. I always tell people like for a little bit of a payout, a little bit of discomfort, right? Like there's, there's, it's a really great outcome really, really great outcome where you just instantly feel better. But you know, when you do gua sha on the feet, I bet sometimes you hit some crunchy points there too. Oh yes. Uh, <laughs> and that's, com- that's completely normal. Um, even like interlacing your, your hand, like your fingers, you know, between your toes. Some people think like, Ooh, that's so weird. But like, think about how much like getting to know your feet and think about how much you're, you're really connected to your own body. When you're like interlacing and like, you know, like this, like holding hands, right. Or, you know, and massaging and rotating it because when you wear high heels, when you wear really tight shoes, your feet can't breathe. And that's how things like plantar fasciitis happen, bunions happen. Yeah. Et cetera. Or just people who like have to be out all day and wear shoes all day. Like that's not good for your feet either because it's just trapped. Right. Exactly. And and then those feet are trapped. They don't like the forefoot, right? Like it should have a lot of room. Like they should move more than we allow them to really. Exactly. They should move more than what we're giving them. So like not wearing like super tight shoes, right? Allowing the forefoot to move. Um, you know, like I dance like salsa for fun, right? And I, ha- I have to wear like a tighter toe box. So for me, like I love taking off my shoes and I have a foot nice. massager. At home, <laughs> so... I use that and I'll do like a foot soak. And for me, it's because like, you know, I want to prevent, you know, the opportunity for like bunions and, you know, future foot pain. Cause I only get one set of feet. I get one set of eyes, one set of ears. Like we take our feet for granted. We don't realize they're holding our weight all day. (laughs) Absolutely. I will say like, you know, when is gua sha appropriate with certain conditions? Now, if you are expecting like someone who is pregnant, you know, talk to your medical doctor about whether or not gua sha, like on the feet, because I know they carry a lot of weight. So the arches start to drop, you know, talk to your doctor about whether or not gua sha is okay or see a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner to see if that is an okay thing to do. Um, Because sometimes what happens is that it can be very stimulating for for a woman who is expecting or someone who is expecting. And, you know, we don't want to cause like, you know, (laughs) inner uterine right. <laughs> stimulation um, that would make a very excited <laughs> pregnancy unless unless you are ready to give birth and you are full term. Yeah. Uh, another thing I wanted to note is how I just realized how like in Eastern culture, like foot health is more important versus like in Western culture, it's like completely like they don't even talk about it. Like it's not a thing to take care of your feet or not as much. Yeah. You know, I always see like TikToks about like, um, like about feet, uh-huh. right? Like, uh, like okay. toe spacers and maybe and whatnot. it's on like, your I feet. That, I, I don't I think really... I, I never knew these things existed. I think it's on my feet. <laughs> this is a new thing for me. I just like last year I learned toe spacers and all these different shoes. I'm surprised you're not getting it in your algorithm then. <laughs> well, maybe now. Why is it? Is it more trending now? I, I'm actually not sure. I don't, I, cause I think oh about my God. feet all day. I think it's you know, just you. So I, I think the majority <laughs> of, I think of, <laughs> of like the mainstream people, they don't know about this. It's about, yeah. about foot health. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, that's, that's my privilege, right? Like the things I like when I think about gua sha, I'm like, yeah, that's completely normal. Ooh, the darker, the better. And like, we're getting somewhere and people will look at me. They're like, they're like jarred. They're like, oh my gosh. Like, did you see the mark? I'm like, Ah, it's just another day in yeah, life. Like, like, it's, <laughs> it's your normal, but to some people, it's like their first time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. So um, foot health, it's, you know, again, this goes back to my mom, like her soaking her feet like every exactly. night. Exactly. That's, that's like an Asian person thing. That is like thing. a thing. I've, like, you know, Asian people it's love Asian having different types thing. of foot massages. And I just, no, all the tools. Oh my gosh. I, lo- I, I told you, I go home and I put my exactly. feet in my foot massager. And I, <laughs> it, yeah. So it's it's a cultural thing, but it's definitely very cultural, but they're smart. They're smart because when you do like foot baths and stuff, right? Like what is that doing? goes back to blood health. Chinese people love blood health. Like it's moving the blood, it doing, keeping, um, warm feet at night. It helps you sleep deeper. It helps you go to sleep faster. 
Okay. Right. So what about for people? <laughs> anyway, we got, we went off on a tangent. That just but. <laughs> gave me another random question. Like what about for people who have like cold feet and cold hands typically? Does it mean you're not as healthy? Like that's a thing, right? When people have cold hands and cold feet, I always, we, so we already kind of just know generally that's a circulation issue, right? Why do people have cold hands and cold feet? Some of it is truly medical. Some Sometimes it can come from medications that you take and it's like a side effect that's causing constriction of the blood vessels, right? Um, and to which I would say, you know, explore that with your medical doctor, right? If that's something that's very concerning to you. Some people get cold hands, cold feet because constitutionally, that's just how they were born, right? We were all born with a different profile. Some people were born with more of an athletic, you know, body. Some people were born more curvy. Some people were born, you know, a lot thinner, a lot more slim. We all have a different profile, you know, when we're born. And that includes the cold hands, cold feet. And that includes people who run very, very hot. So I see people like that all the time in my clinic. And I'm always trying to bring them to a better homeostasis, a happier homeostasis, right? So that's like a place where like we're in a happy medium and it is good enough and great enough for you, you know, because that's going to look different on everybody. Um, And I've used gua sha like on myself, like I usually sometimes have cold feet. I've used gua sha on the lower parts of my leg to help improve blood flow to my feet and they'll get instantly warm. So that tells me like, oh, like I had some adhesions. I had some actual issues like with something's blood not flow, blood circulation. Okay. Right. Whether I like worked out a lot and I didn't do enough mm-hmm. recovery work. Right. So I fixed my own circulation issue that way. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So, but having cold hands, cold feet is technically not a good thing in yeah. Chinese medicine. You want to have warm hands, warm feet yeah. all year round. And a really cool phenomenon that happens, uh, I think it's more seen in women than it is in men because uh, men have higher testosterone levels. So they tend to run warmer in general. But for women, women in Chinese medicine are cooler in nature. They're called yin, Y I N. So, we're, we're already kind of cold and cool. It's, it's our feminine, right? And what's really interesting is with the weather changes, you'll feel your body start to constrict. And then when it's summer, your body starts to warm up and starts to open. So maybe like in the fall, winter time, you see yourself running cooler and more cold and the hands stay more cool and cold. But then once it's spring and, and summertime, body doesn't have to work as hard trying to stay warm because the environment is already warm. Yeah. I, I'm a person that naturally runs cooler. And then my boyfriend's like, he runs so super hot. Like he's like sweating when he's, he's sleeping. Yeah. One side exactly. like easy, one side heat. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just, just learning about things like gua sha to help circulation and like to warm up the feet. Cause once you do gua sha on mm-hmm. your feet, they do get warm. Yes. It gets warm because you're, you're using that friction mechanism to generate heat. The thing is, there will be a period of time where the body will start to contract and cool from the gua sha because nothing that's causing caused by friction, if you don't continue it, like it will eventually need to cool, right? So um, one really important thing is that whenever I do neck or body gua sha, like on the back, I always tell people cover up like right away. And they're like, oh, but it's like warm and it's hot. And I'm like, no, 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 cover up right away. You want to retain the heat that's expelled. Um, we're brought to the surface because your body's going to start cooling, cooling it down because you're also opening up the pores in the back and those will eventually close because, um, not that this has ever happened to me, but I've had, but like, if that's like worst case scenario, someone got gua sha on their neck and back and the pores are open and they're going, they're walking around shirtless and it's cold. That's like the wind is hitting their back. That's how people get sick and contracted right? And we don't want like outside influences if we can control them, right? So you know how like your mom always says like, oh, like grab a jacket, cover up your neck, yeah. you're going to get sick. She had a good reason. You, that's, how, that's how outside in, in influences viruses or environment um, can well, actually you're saying get through you the sick pores? if you don't protect. Through the pores. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you just reminded me of like what Asian's yeah. moms say, like, oh, don't, don't wash your hair at night or don't like 
like don't the wash pour, your hair at night. The, some, the yep. wind will get in. And I was like, what does that even mean? <laughs> yeah, you know what's really funny? And I used to wash my hair at night. Yeah, all so the tell time us why. In my 20s. Why, and I got why can't away we with do it. that? Well, we can't do that because when your head is wet and it should be warm, right? You are allowing your, your, basically what's happening is you're causing damp in the body. Damp just means that it's, so the body likes to stay dry on the outside, right? But when you're causing damp, you're allowing opportunities for sickness, invasions. We call them external invasions. So whether you're getting sick from something environmental or there's some kind of virus that can be introduced into the body and you're near it, that's how mm. you can get sick. So like when it comes to having like wet hair for bedtime, right? One, you're sleeping in that and there's no opportunity for the head to dry. And I wouldn't be surprised if people woke up with a headache or a stiff neck because anything that's wet and cold that touches the neck because the neck is very fragile already, you have opportunities to get sick and be in pain. And I and I wanted to mention that I got when I was younger, I got away with having bedhead, wet bedhead hair. But then I've noticed recently in my 30s, I took very rarely that I take very late showers at night. I took a late shower at night and I went, I dried off my hair, I went to bed. I had the worst headache and neck pain ever. And I was like, <laughs> oh, the engine check line, yeah. check, check light came on for me. Oh I was like, gosh. this is it. I'm a mortal. Uh, I knew it. I was a mortal. <laughs> that's just something I've heard, but I never understood why. Like, you know, but it, yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. Everything from like the neck and above is, is very sensitive and fragile. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of like, we have a lot of ability to absorb force, but why, right? Like if we can do things to prevent our body from deteriorating and, you know, being introduced to these type of like risk. And um, that's why I say like covering up your neck after gua sha is very essential to the healing process. Like we're doing something so great, right? We're causing, we're, we're venting heat and we're causing heat and we're moving all this like fresh blood to the area you're going to you're going to like reverse all the really good effects just because you didn't do good, you know, post op care. Yeah. Okay, so I want to ask how do you use gua sha in your routine? Like is there something that you do weekly, daily? How often how long are you spending on this? I'm lucky cuz I have the skill. I know how fast and how long I need to do gua sha, but I love doing gua sha whenever I get migraines or headaches that are not hormonal. It's truly just tension headaches um, or neck stiffness or shoulder pain. Um, so for me, I do about twice, about twice a month. So it's like every other week, right? Because it's, to me, it's like really important to take care of my body so I can take care of my patients. Because what I do, like while I use a lot of brain power, it's also a physical work too right? And as I get older, you know, my body won't run as fast as like someone who's like, you know, 18 years old <laughs> and that can get away with a lot more. So for me, like I like to use it more for like neck pain, headache, shoulder pain. And if I'm lucky, if I can get my mom or someone that I, you know, loosely trained in gua sha, um, I will, I love getting it for like my mid back and like shoulder blades. Awesome. Okay. Uh, do you have any final words that you want to share with the audience? Maybe to encourage them to try? <laughs> yeah. You know, just even beyond gua sha, which I think everyone should experience at some point because, and it, the really difficult part is finding a practitioner that does it. A, and usually it's through a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. I feel like for those practitioners, they choose not to offer gua sha because it doesn't cater to the the taste of like the US, right? Where things needed to be a little more blanketed, a little more softened. But to me, like medicine is is whatever it takes, right? So medicine isn't a gummy right? Like something that's good tasting. Like when I tell people to take like mm -hmm. Chinese herbs, right? Um, and gua sha doesn't look pretty. Cupping marks look funny and they don't mm -hmm. look great either, right? Um, acupuncture initially doesn't always feel great, but people always like yeah. the results. And that's how we should treat medicine in general, 
right? And it's it's like knowing that you're doing something good for your body and also that you're helping yourself because we get this amazing vessel to exist in and we have to be really great at taking care of it. I'll never know when I'm going to get my next vessel, right? Maybe after I move on and I pass and I'm, I come back as Celine Dion or something. I don't know, like, <laughs> <laughs> or come back as like Wolverine. I, I don't know what, whatever, you know, whatever life decides to take me. It's just that I'm here now and I want to have a great quality of life. And so everything that I say to myself and how I speak to myself, it radiates into my body and every stress that I put into it, my body also feels that. So that's the bigger picture and bigger message that I always want to send to people that you only get this one amazing vessel and you got to make the most of it. So your, the demands that you ask from it is just as important as the restoration that you need to give it. Love that. Thank you so much, Eileen. Where can we find you online? Yeah, you can find me on TikTok and Instagram. My user handle is anew.acu. So it's A-N-E-W dot A-C-U. Thank you so much. I learned so much and I appreciate all that you share on your TikTok. It's like, I'm just so proud of you like for, for growing it and for doing what you do. Thank you. You know, for me, it's like... um I, what did I envision the last year, the last year since like I suddenly amassed this like big following is just being able to make Chinese medicine accessible and sharing a new approach on how to share traditions, right? Um, There's something for everyone here. So it brings me a lot of happiness and joy to be able to be on your podcast today and share that message. Yeah, I so support your mission because I think more people need to know this stuff. So thank you so much. Yeah, and just being able to help yourself is such a nice way to like yes. empower, yes. feel empowered, right? Um, and I always say to people like, I could teach, I could give you fish, but why not teach mm-hmm. you how to fish? You know, why not teach you how to better understand how you operate in your day to day? Because as long as we're open minded, we can always learn from something from someone. And that's what's so amazing about having this platform to go on TikTok and Instagram is being able to build a community and talk about these things. And like to me, like I said, my privilege, but it's also my honor to be able to share. Amazing. Thank you again. 